JPQL is the most common way to query data from a database with JPA. It enables you to reuse your mapping definitions and is easier to use than SQL. But it supports only a small subset of the SQL standard and it also provides no support for database specific features. So, what shall you do if you need to use a database specific query feature or your DBA gives you a highly optimized query that you can transform into JPQL? Just ignore it and do all the work in the Java code? <laughs> of course not. JPA has its own query language, but it's designed as a leaky abstraction and supports native SQL queries. You can create these queries in a similar way as JPQA queries, and they can even return managed entities if you want. In this video, I will show you how to use native SQL queries, different options to map the query results to DTOs and entity objects, and avoid a common performance pitfall. Hi, I'm Torben Janssen. If you want to build incredible efficient persistence layers with Hibernate and Spring Data JPA, please subscribe and click the bell to get new videos every week. And also don't forget to like this video if you found it helpful. Like JPQA queries, you can define your native SQL queries ad hoc or use an annotation to define a named native query. Creating an ad hoc native query is quite simple. The Entity Manager interface provides the create native query method for it. It returns an implementation of the query interface, which is the same that you get when you call the create query method to create a JPQA query. This code shows a simple example of using a native query to select the first and last name from the author table. I know there is no need to do this with a native SQA query. I could use a standard JPQA query for this, but I want to focus on the JPA part and not bother you with some crazy SQL stuff. The persistence provider does not pass the SQL statement, so that you can use any SQL statement your database supports. For example, in one of my recent projects, I used it to query PostgreSQL specific JSON B columns with Hibernate and map the query results to POJOs and entities. As you can see, you can use the created query in the same way as any JPQA query. I didn't provide any mapping information for the result. Because of that, the entity manager returns a list of object arrays which you need to handle afterward. Instead of mapping the result yourself, you can also provide additional mapping information and let the entity manager do the mapping for you. I get into more details about that in the result handling section at the end of this video. You will not be surprised if I tell you that the definition and usage of a named native query are again very similar to a named JPQA query. In the previous example, I created a dynamic native query to select the names of all authors. I used the same statement to define a named native query. Since Hibernate 5 and JPA 2.2, this annotation is repeatable and you can add multiple of it to your entity class. If you're using an older JPA or Hibernate version, you need to wrap it in a named native queries annotation. As you can see, the definition looks very similar to the one of a named JPQA query. As I will show you in the following part, you can even include the result mapping, but more on that later. You can use the named native query in exactly the same way as a named JPQA query. You only need to provide the name of the named native query as a parameter to the create named query method of the entity manager. Similar to JPQA queries, you can and should use parameter bindings for your query parameters instead of putting the values directly into the query string. This provides several advantages. You do not need to worry about SQL injection. The persistence provider maps your query parameters to the correct types, and the persistence provider can do internal optimizations to improve the performance. JPQL and native SQL queries use the same query interface, which provides a set parameter method for positional and named parameter bindings. But the support of named parameter bindings for native queries is a Hibernate specific feature. Positional parameters are referenced as question marks in your native query, and their numbering starts at 1. Here you can see an example of an ad hoc native SQL query with a positional bind parameter. 
you can use the bind parameter in the same way in a named native query. Hibernate also supports named parameter bindings for native queries, but as I already said, this is not defined by the specification and might not be portable to other JPA implementations. By using name parameter bindings, you define a name for each parameter and provide it to the setParameter method to bind a value to it. The name is case sensitive and you need to add the colon symbol as a prefix. As you have seen in the previous examples, your native query returns an object array or a list of object arrays. If you want to retrieve your query result as a different data structure, you need to provide additional mapping information to your persistence provider. There are three commonly used options. You can map each record of your query result to a managed entity using the entity's mapping definition. Or you can use JPA's SQL result set mapping annotation to map each result record to a combination of DTOs, managed entities, or Scala values. And you can use Hibernate's result transformer to map each record or the entire result set to DTOs, managed entities, or Scala values. Reusing the mapping definition of your entity class is the simplest way to map each record of the query result to a managed entity object. When doing that, you need to select all columns mapped by the entity class using the alias used in your entity's mapping definition. Next, you need to tell your persistence provider to which entity class it shall map the query result. For an ad hoc native SQL query, you do that by providing a class reference as a parameter to the create native query method. You can do the same using a named native query by referencing the entity class as the named native query's result class attribute. Hibernate then automatically applies that mapping when you execute that query. JPA's SQL result set mapping is much more flexible than the previous one. You can not only use it to map your query result to managed entity objects, but also to DTOs, Scala values, and any combination of these. The only limitation is that Hibernate applies the defined mapping to each record of the result set. Due to that, you can't easily group multiple records of your result set. These mappings are quite powerful, but their definition can get complex. That's why I only provide a quick introduction in this video. If you want to dive deeper into SQL result set mappings, you can find links in the video description. Here you can see a basic example of a DTO mapping. Every SQL result set mapping has to have a unique name within the persistence unit. You will use it in your code to reference this mapping definition. The constructor result annotation tells Hibernate to call the constructor of the book author class and provide the result set's ID, first name, last name, and numbook fields as parameters. This enables you to instantiate unmanaged DTO objects, which are a great fit for all read only operations. After defining the mapping, you can provide its name as the second parameter to the create native query method. Hibernate will then look up the mapping definition within the current persistence unit and apply it to every record of the result set. And similar to the previous examples, you can apply the same mapping to a named native query by providing the name of the mapping as the result set mapping attribute. After you did that, you can execute your named native query and Hibernate applies the SQL result set mapping automatically. Result Transformer are a Hibernate specific feature with the same goal as JPA's SQL result set mapping. They allow you to define a custom mapping of the result set of your native query. But in contrast to the SQL result set mapping, you implement that mapping as Java code and you can map each record or the entire result set. Hibernate provides a set of standard transformers and the implementation of the custom transformer got much easier in Hibernate 6. I explained all of that in great detail and the difference between the Hibernate versions in my guide to Result Transformer. This example shows the implementation of the tuple transformer for Hibernate 6. It applies the same mapping as the previously used SQL result set mapping. As you can see, I called the set tuple transformer method to add the transformer to the query. That makes the transformer independent of the query 
and you can apply it to a named native query in the same way. At the beginning of the video, I mentioned that Hibernate doesn't pass your native SQL statement. That provides the benefit that you're not limited to the features Hibernate supports, but that you can use all features supported by your database. But it also makes it impossible to determine the query space. The query space describes which entity classes your query references. Hibernate uses it to optimize the dirty check and flush operation that it has to perform before executing the query. I explain this in more detail in Hibernate Query Spaces, Optimizing Flush and Cache Operations. The important thing you need to know when using native SQL queries is to specify the query space. You can do that by unwrapping Hibernate Synchronizable Query from JPA's query interface and calling the add synchronized entity class method with a reference to your entity class. This tells Hibernate which entity classes your query references. It can then limit the dirty check to objects of these entity classes and flush them to the database. While doing that, Hibernate ignores all changes on entity objects of other entity classes. This avoids unnecessary database operations and allows Hibernate to apply further performance optimizations. JPQL is the most commonly used query language with JPA and Hibernate. It provides an easy way to query data from the database, but it supports only a small subset of the SQL standard, and it also does not support database-specific features. If you want to use any of these features, you need to use a native SQL query. You can define a native ad hoc query by calling the entity manager's create native query method and providing the SQL statement as a parameter. Or you can use the named native query annotation to define a named query that you can execute in the same way as JPQL's named query. Native queries return their result as an object array or a list of object arrays. You can convert this in multiple ways. If you select all columns mapped by an entity class, you can provide a class reference as the second parameter to the create native query method. Hibernate then applies that class mapping to each record in the result set and returns managed entity objects. If you want to map the result to DTOs, you need to define an SQL result set mapping or implement a Hibernate specific result transformer. And you should always define the query space of your native queries. It enables Hibernate to optimize the dirty check and flush operation it needs to perform before executing the query. Okay, that's it for today. If you want to learn more about Hibernate and JPA, you should join the Persistence Hub. It gives you access to all my video courses, including one about Spring Data JPA and another one about Hibernate performance tuning, two monthly Q&A calls, monthly coding challenges, a community of like-minded developers, and regular expert sessions. And if you like today's video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe below. Bye.